Well, I have been waiting for all conference for this particular session. I moved here in July of 1981, and my first job was with one of the two architects that did hotel casinos in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And I got put into a small office with Roger Thomas and the beginnings of Atlantia Design. It was maybe four of us in this space for about four or five months designing a mega resort that was going to go next to what was the Sahara Hotel. It's now the SLS. That project was one of the ghost projects of Las Vegas and there's been. Since 1981, I don't think I've gone one year without working with Roger. I've been really fortunate because Roger is one of the most talented, educated, articulate, interesting people I've ever gotten to know. And to become a friend with him has been a real privilege. And I'm honored to introduce him. And as I introduce him, I have to say that this session is sponsored by Weber Inc. that provides owners representative services that save clients time and money since 2003. Roger Thomas is the foremost designer of elegant entertainment spaces and venues in America, but worldwide today. And <coughs> most of you should know from Mirage Treasure Island, the Nugget, Waggio, Wind, Encore, Ophir, and Macau. He has a line of interior furnishings for hospitality and residential settings. That's amazing. And has coined the term architecture. He's creative, inventive, and visionary. And it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Roger Tom. Thank you. So, uh, just a couple of notes. First of all, I have never read a speech before in my life, but you're about to get that premiere, uh, and uh, uh, it's going to go for 182 slides long in 40 minutes. So, hang on to your seats. If you get travel sickness, you may want to uh, take precaution. First, I'd like to thank my lifelong friends, John Spare and John Cly, who asked me to speak today. If you enjoy my presentation, they are deserving of the credit. If you do not, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. <laughs> I did not learn from Las Vegas as a graduate student or renowned professor of architecture armed with deep knowledge, sophistication, and experience. Robert Venturi, Denise Scott Brown, and Stephen Eisenhower's Learning from Las Vegas is a seminal and important work. It changed our worldview and greatly influenced the built environment that followed it. But mine is a different learning from Las Vegas. I lived it for 65 years. I'm going to give a short, illustrated, personal history to explain my view and bias and my motivation, elements key to all creators, then my career and also a history and my learning path. Today, I will take you through my learning in six stages, elementary school enchantment, high school disillusionment, and experience of the real world, art school and a bachelor's degree, rebellion through rejection, on-the-job training and private tutorials with Stephen Elaine Wynn. Fifth is graduate studies, learning from seeking, mostly study abroad. And sixth is graduation, flying solo with the net, my personal renaissance caused by loss of my personal history. Forgive me, this is a technical difficulty. See if I can get past it. Uh, so, uh oh, real technical difficulties. One moment, forgive me. Um, so, it was nice to be introduced by John. Okay, I think we can proceed now. Uh, who I have known for nearly 37 years. 
And let me begin uh, by saying that I am unusual in that I have had one client for 37, almost 38 years. So the development of my history, uh, both learning and through the entire uh, process of working here in Las Vegas, has been unique, to say the least, in that I've never had to seek a job. I don't carry cards because I don't have to seek a job. Um, I've been able to focus on one client, learning that client, uh, and I've never had to really learn the culture of another client. So the way I, um, the way I proceeded through my career is not the way anybody else has, so understanding that. Uh, so mine is a different way of learning from Las Vegas. I lived it for 65 years. I've done that already. We have to wait for my scroll to catch up. I, forgive me. Uh, just a minute. I can, I'm trying to riff for a minute. I'm having a little technical thing up here. As I said, I've never uh, read a, a, done a proprompter before, and it's a little daunting, but I think we got it. Um, so as I said, we're going to go through the six stages. Elementary school, art school, on-the-job training, graduate studies, graduation, flying solo with a net. This was supposed to be seamless. Here we go. First elementary school enchantment. I grew up in privilege. I was moved from my birthplace, Salt Lake City, Utah, to Las Vegas at the age of three because my father, E. Perry Thomas, and his lifelong partner, Jerome Mack, founded the Bank of Las Vegas, becoming the first bank to lend to casinos and to solicit their business. It was not unusual for the family to dine watching the dancing waters at the Desert Inn, go to a dinner show at the Sands, or celebrate birthdays at the House of Lord in the Sahara or at the Dome of the Sea at the Dunes. Friends of my father's and neighbors owned the Thunderbird, the Tropicana, the show boat, which miraculously parked a huge Mississippi paddle boat in the middle of the desert, and my mother particularly liked Sunday brunch at the Tudor-themed Tally Ho because it did not have a casino. Obviously, that is until it failed into and added a casino and became the Aladdin, an Arabian Nights-themed concoction, 40 thieves in all, with the original half-timber Tudor room still stuck on at the rear, surrounded by parking, asphalt, then desert. I learned to swim with a group of kids that included Eliza Minnelli at the Old Frontier, and it was normal to have parents who had gone to dinner one year with Debbie Reynolds and Eddie Fisher, a year later with Elizabeth Taylor and Eddie Fisher, and years more later with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. In other words, we had full access to the Las Vegas of the 50s and 60s. We had atom bombs to watch, glamour, or at least glitz, and a reputation as Sin City. As a sensitive boy who had decided to be an artist, I was hyper aware of my environment, of the casinos, of the showrooms. It seemed to me that they wanted their guests to feel like they were somewhere else, somewhere other than Las Vegas, somewhere besides in a desert. Interiors promised a different climate, air-conditioned, a different code of ethics in a world physically far away from whatever your daily life experience was. <clears throat> it seemed to my young mind that you could do all of this with stucco, cut crystals, vinyl, and a coat of paint, often red, carpet in the appropriate themed pattern, often red, and matching large themed chandeliers. Hotel interior design was calculated to entice, even to trap and to transport you to an other world, where there were no daily cares, rooms and food were either free or very inexpensive, and time was banished by both decor and lack of daylight. No clocks were allowed, strange as everyone had one on their wrist. I will always remember my childhood as going from the dim, garish hotel interior into the intense light and heat of day under ever-changing port cochers shaded to aid the transition. Guests were encouraged to stay at the tables and slots where it was cool, and worries were eliminated by costume cocktail waitresses offering free drinks as enticements. 99-cent shrimp cocktails were ubiquitous. 
and if you craved a dose of daytime desert, every hotel offered a pool evidently surrounded by bathing beauties. High school and disillusionment. My world perception of architecture and design was radically altered by a visit to San Francisco in the Palace of the Legion of Honor. I was in a place that felt more than paint deep. It was connected to the earth rather than floating in the desert. It felt human and important. It felt more real, and I wanted to wander its rooms for hours, not caring what lay beyond. I did not know then that I was caught in a pastiche of design that felt real and right because it honored the classic rules, proportion and alignments of Palladio, despite it being a replica of Belle Epoque Paris. It was filled with art and with history. It was right and good, and Las Vegas became thinner and increasingly less able to amaze or even amuse me. This experience would forever color my view of Las Vegas. Disillusionment had set in. A new player came to town, Jay Sarno in Caesar's Palace, inspired by the ultimate stay and play resort concept of its day, the masterful Fountain Blow Miami by Morris Lapidus. Jay Sarno decided to go the elegant Fountain Blow one better. If you're going to alter reality and encourage the kind of behavior that can bring down civilizations, how about ancient Rome? The facade was set back from the fabulous strip, a new innovation, providing not only room for a still larger marquee sign, but to include an experience beginning at the street. Caesars provided a flat approach with fountains, more French than Italian, in a move reminiscent of Bernini's colonnade at the Vatican. This provided both animation and air cooling to, outdoor, to the outdoor room, creating the sensual appeal of sight, sound, touch, and smell. Caesar's Piazza Colonnade was ingeniously created by replacing expensive marble with the economical and thematic Italian Cyprus. An elevated entry was inspired evidently by a poker chip caddy and framed by a colonnade of arches that spoke as much of George Jetson as Julius Caesar or Palladio, and it included the new innovation of an elevated noble casino floor accessed by broad steps. It was an irresistible invitation. Caesars established a new mark of fantasy with a casino that boasted the world's largest chandelier, and chandelier is in quotations, and a Playboy magazine inspired luxury suites, raking in the major players from the Riviera, the Dunes, the Sands, and the Desert Inn by sheer force of promise and escape into Hefnerian hedonism without need of judgment or the discomfort of moral consequence. A world of the kind of indulgence before only dictators could experience was now available for the price of a nickel slot or a friendly cocktail on Cleopatra's barge. Caesar's was not a new place to go, but the place to go and to be seen. The important development here is that fantasy and guest experience became the focus of and an integral part of the design. For instance, Scantily clad slave girls actually fed peeled grapes to male diners lounging in the intimately decadent bacchanal room, requiring Rakamia couches. Costumes and choreography had left the stage in Las Vegas and appeared in the casino and restaurants. A man's home may have still been his castle in the 60s, but Caesar's palace was his empire. Oh, ladies were also allowed in, especially at the opulent pal palace court, where jewels and furs were encouraged, especially in the air-conditioned summers. In the mid-60s, my father and partner Jerry Mack succeeded in changing the existing laws to allow casinos to be owned by publicly traded companies for the first time. Las Vegas' architecture and design was about to explode with the flow of funding this provided. Everyone added a tower, and if they already had one, a second. The era of theme design was about to explode. Art school and bachelor's degree rejection. This is when I leave Las Vegas for educational transformation at Interlochen Arts Academy in Michigan, then on to the School of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, where I earned a degree in studio arts and art history, specifically Native American art history, very useful. I returned to Las Vegas after six years, a modernist with a vocabulary of New York architecture and art augmented by the lessons of Europe's, Europe's capitals and museums. During these years, my family lived on top of the original Tower of the Sahara. Everyday life in a casino can really tear at the 
veil of illusion. I opened the Las Vegas offices of famed casino design firm Yates Silverman of Los Angeles, where I had worked during my high school and college summers. Their famous credo was, it may not be in good taste, but make it taste good. In rebellion, I focused on seven years of bank design for the family and forays into casino owners' suites and homes. Mies van der Rohe's Less Than More was my credo, amazing I know to most of you, and my design reference. And any design reference before 1950 was banished. Oh, and red paint and carpets were also banished. Natural light was celebrated, and I established the largest public art collection in the state with the bank's headquarter offices. The single moment that most changed my life and defined my career happened one night at a dinner when family friend Steve and Elaine Wynn offered me a job at their Golden Nuggets design arm at Landia, which is when I joined John Spare for a tour of duty. On the job training with private tutorials by Steve and Elaine Wynn. Steve wanted to change Las Vegas to offer real experiences with authenticity in his fantastic environments and to appeal to more educated, well-traveled, and sophisticated guests. He directed that we would distinguish ourselves from the herd with elevated materials, superior style, and taste. Designs considered of the guest with comfort considered from their point of view and with extraordinary personalized services. No costumes or fantasy, just an exceptional, fetching, attractive resort. Staff would be dressed for their personal comfort and dignity, never for effect. Stephen Elaine's philosophy was always to design for the smartest, most demanding, most discerning guest, and to always, always, always think like that guest. Steve directed us to create what has never been seen before and to pay attention to experience and quality each step of the way. The big lesson of learning from this, that beautiful, authentic reality is always a better way to fulfill the promise of an unforgettable memory than the most lavishly constructed fantasy. The Golden Nugget where I started was on Fremont Street, not a place known for the big players, but Steve took aim directly at Caesar's guests. Steve offered real opulence with original style. We built the spa suite tower in the late 80s and my career, as I know it, began. Steve believed that design could overcome geography and it worked. Now the Golden Nugget was the place to be seen and most importantly, the experience to remember. More of what I learned from the Golden Nugget. I learned to honor what you crave. What delights you will delight others. It makes the experience original, surprising, and thoughtful. I learned to pay attention to the smallest details. The others don't take the time. It makes experience comfortable and memorable. I learned that the advantage of an in-house design team was huge. We could spend more time creating and less learning about the client. I learned to create as much as I could custom, to design and make original pieces whenever time and budget allowed. It makes the experience unique. I learned to use drama as much as possible, but never try to fool the guest with artificial effects. It's a very thin line. I learned that authenticity is the goal in the experience, not fantasy. Authenticity is believable and memorable. Fantasy is too thin to be memorable. I learned that as the interior designer, I'm responsible for everything, for all five senses, for proper air temperature, considerate wayfinding, and alluring tastes and scents. They're all part of guest comfort. I learned to draw every idea I had and that I would need them someday. The Mirage changed everything. I was originally one of three interior designers on the project and only responsible for the rooms and the suites. I completed the project with all of those plus 60% of the public spaces as well. Lessons were learned. I learned that suites in tropical materials and colors did not appeal to the Asian player, the fastest growing demographic of the high end trade. It's how the poor live at home. They demanded European elegance, resulting in a redesign that started four months before a grand opening, a 
and was ready for opening day. I learned that all good project design requires an enormous commitment of hours. The date of opening the cash registers never changes. Over time is the norm. I learned that if I was going to design resonant experience, I must go out and actually have them. I learned to pick artists for inspiration, to use what I know well. Matisse and Gauguin informed my color and my form. And with the Mirage, we invented three new hospitality forms. First, the mega resort. At this scale, success of experience in detail is crucial right down to the dolphins. The second form, the Salon Privé, or private gaming salon, the first ever license was conceived as a gentleman's library, but books contain the names of the dead and are forbidden in Asian gaming, so in an overnight redesign, it became a gentleman collector's cabinet of curiosities. Cultures differ greatly, learn them. Third was the villa, conceived, built, and completed nine months they were to be the most extraordinary accommodations on planet Earth and became the first completed Las Vegas design to enter the hallowed pages of Architectural Digest. I was told that I was to have an unlimited budget, but then I was told I had exceeded that unlimited budget, <laughs> a reputation that follows me to this day. In the villas, we offered variety and private gardens with spas, pools, and putting greens. Considerate and experienced focused design, truly unforgettable. Perhaps most importantly, we learned the great lesson that natural light, planting, and gardens are important to all humans. Banished was the no daylight rule. We also learned that to elevate guest service, it was crucial to design elevated experience for the service staff that the back of house and staff dining areas must be as elegant as the guest areas. The success and phenomenon of the Mirage, against most predictions, began the golden age of development in Las Vegas. At this point, publicly traded Las Vegas companies continue to develop more mega resorts intent on offering any experience except the Mojave Desert. Within a few days, the old Las Vegas I knew of my youth was altered or imploded. Oops, that was supposed to run a movie. I'm sorry, that was, the, we were supposed to be experiencing the, the, the implosion of the Dunes Hotel. Uh, and for any of you who were there or watched it or were familiar with it, we loaded every floor of the Dunes Hotel with jet fuel, uh, which was time to explode with the explosion of the hotel, which was set off by firing a cannon at the Treasure Island towards the uh, Dunes Hotel uh, when the uh, jet fuel on all the floors exploded and Garucci fireworks went off overhead. When Steve did explosions, we, uh, we added all of those things. During this period, first Steve developed Treasure Island, what I come now to call the Projet de Montreguet, and the first time I used the term replitecture. It was also the project I toured with Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. They were graciously speechless. <laughs> what did I learn from this? It's fun to design a theme and get into costume, but it's a costume and it's tiring to stay in it, plus difficult to teach character to staff and totally inappropriate to have a pirate wish you good day or a wench clean your room. Even though our design reference no longer existed on planet Earth so that there were no ready comparisons, it was still not a deep, resonant experience or one that begged repeating. I learned never to do an entire project bow to stern alone again. It's exhausting and it lacks the spice and variety of multiple visions. Graduate studies next. The resort that will become Bellagio is to be in Steve Words, the single most elegant, fetching, and alluring resort hotel on planet Earth. It is to set a new level of luxury and experience far above anything else. We learn by invention. Bellagio breaks new rules. Restaurants are designed for revenue and excitement and enticement by experience. Sorry. Uh, 
and excitement of experience. This was the first time a hotel was built where the rooms were designed for revenue, the restaurants were designed for revenue, they were larger and more elegant, the, uh, uh, the casino was seen as one source of, of revenue, but not as the primary driver. We did not reduce anything as enticement. The designs were made enticing at, in and of themselves. So the rooms were larger, they were more commodious, we could charge more. The suites were larger and more elegant and European this time to begin with. Uh, so they attracted the Asian high roller. Uh, and the retail experience was, the, this was the first time major brands from around the world were brought into Las Vegas uh, for the retail experience. Uh, in what has become our favorite, one of our favorite much repeated uh, theories of spatial design, which is the uh, uh, retail promenade at Bellagio, which is actually a Palladian golden means. The width of the space and the height of the spring line are exactly the same. Uh, the the uh, proportion of the arch completing the golden mean of the rectangle. Uh, it has worked every time we've done it. We also learned that um, that art galleries, that art in and of itself is an attraction in and of itself. We had more people visit the gallery at Bellagio on certain days than the Museum of Modern Art in New York on those same days. It was the first art gallery experience in Las Vegas. One thing I have learned is that Steve Wynn only been, builds for the opportunity to remodel this. This is, I'm sorry, I apologize. Okay, we'll add lid from here. So by this time, uh, after the Mirage and Bellagio, it set off in a period of expansion funded by publicly traded money uh, that allowed you to go almost anywhere you wanted in Earth. You could go to Paris, you could go to Venice, you could go to the Egyptian, the Egypt of the Pharaohs, you could go to, uh, uh, exotic South Sea Islands, you could go to Arthurian England, uh, and through the magic of uh, what I call replitecture, the idea that you can design a space to replicate another time or another period, you could even visit New York City. It's about this time that Steve buys the Desert Inn Hotel. Uh, the year is 2000 and he buys it for Elaine Wynn on her birthday as a gift. Um, and we begin the experience that is going to be Wynn Hotels. Wow, I, have, I don't know how this skipped so far. And I wasn't prepared to ad lib, so we'll try this. Uh, so this is the first time that Steve asks me to design something that's not based on any previous experience I've had. Bellagio was based on the architecture of Northern Italy and Southern France. The Mirage was based on travels that both my family and his were taking in uh, Caribbean islands, and you could see how that contributed to design. But with Gwyn, I was supposed to outstrip Bellagio. I was supposed to create an even more fetching project, and it had to be entirely unique. It had to be a project that was based on something no one had ever seen before. So I realized I wasn't going to be able to reference any existing architectural vocabulary, that I would have to invent uh, not only a new vocabulary, but I would have to invent a new alphabet. So with the Mirage, we, with the, the Wynn Hotel, we set about doing exactly that. Uh, we set about creating spaces that had never been seen before. All, I started with the vocabulary, the alphabet being female forms, high contrast in, uh, in color and material, uh, and delight of movement. A lot of what we did was created by um, building models. This is a model built in a Butler building on the Desert Inn Golf Course before it was imploded, uh, which allowed us to test the casino. We found that in design, that exploring designs for grandeur did not work. That whenever we made spaces really large uh, and, uh, and exploded, that it was grand and you experienced it as you walked through it, but that you remembered intimate spaces and you wanted to stay, to stay in smaller, more intimate spaces. 
that it was the attraction of intimacy and creating scale that was more human that made more sense. Uh, evidently, that broke all the rules of casino design as we know it, but it's what we did. We developed uh, this Butler Building model over a two-year period, changing everything in it. Carpet, wall cover, the way we did the canopies overhead, the light fixtures, everything in it was changed at a great expense for a long time. But doing that allowed us to create the only intimate uh, chandelier 21 tables ever created because we could prove to the Nevada Gaming Commission that our security cameras hidden within the chandeliers along with the security cameras in the rest of the casino actually performed better than without the chandeliers. We also decided that we would not do this alone. Uh, we decided, like at Bellagio, that we would uh, invite uh, guest designers to join us in the pursuit of what we were doing. This is uh, created by Hirsch Bedner in Los Angeles. Uh, Jeffrey Beers created this restaurant for um, uh, a noted chef, which uh, oh, I can't remember right now. Uh, I'm so sorry that I can't find my place in this. Um, And we created, uh, we created restaurants that um, were formed with ideas of experience. For instance, Bartolotto, which was uh, created to honor uh, olive oil as the basis of Italian cooking, hence these huge uh, olive oil jars, and created around uh, the most fetching invitation we've ever had, which was the mountain created in front of wind. No more exploding. Uh, pirate ships, no more volcanoes, no more d dizzy fountains, but the greatest invitation of all, which is a keep out sign. What's inside? What if you're promising this huge mountain on the outside, you'll simply have to come in to find out uh, what you're about to experience, which allowed us these uh, intimate gatherings of uh, experience around the, uh, around the lakes. Rooms were created in a completely different way. This time the glass was floor to ceiling so that you were truly in Las Vegas. We hadn't done that before. Rooms always had windows. This time Las Vegas was one wall of the room. Suites were larger and more uh, inv invitational. This is not actually a suite, but one of the models that we created with suite. Again, floor to ceiling with greater experience. Suites on the golf course. Uh, on the level of villas, uh, but offered at a lesser uh, uh, economy so that you could have this kind of experience without having to uh, be a villa guest in one of the five villas. We had a great idea for entertainment. The nightclub era was coming to Las Vegas, and we decided to create a nightclub where privacy for our celebrity guests was the uh, driving force. Uh, and this is how we opened uh, Lure, a club terrible idea. Privacy is not important. Ninety days later, we created Blush on the bones of Laura, which was Las Vegas' greatest living room. Everybody wanted to be at the same party. And for the third time, we were honored with Architectural Digest recognizing our villas as uh, in their magazine. And we upped the villa game with even more lavish, more dramatic, more greater experience uh, glass boxes set in a garden with adjacent uh, extraordinary media rooms, uh, bedrooms that were dramatic uh, and, and lavish. But Steve Wynn, I have learned, only creates for the opportunity to remodel, which is actually a crucial ingredient to a successful Las Vegas hotel. Success brings both wear and tear along with, and f along with familiarity. Remember that surprise is very important. We changed all of the rooms after six years and the suites with them. But classical bones make for refreshing faster and easier, reimagining often only the soft, perishable finishes needed to replace. In the last five years, we have refreshed and remodeled every restaurant, every suite, and every room. Nightclubs have become high-limit gaming spaces. This is Wing Lei as we 
or opened it, Wingway, five years later, the bar as we opened it, and the bar after reimagining it. The room designed by Jacques Garcia, the great French designer, as we opened, and five years later. The Zumi restaurant you saw an earlier, five years later. This is that nightclub you saw that became a gaming space with a garden view. Even the villas have been reimagined. What we have learned as a design team, Steve Wynn, Derider Butler, and I, along with our studio of 30 and 20 year long veterans like Karina Ashworth, Charles Gonzalez, and Brian Diedrich, plus 60 others, has developed the craft of integrated architecture and interior design that I have come to call Eve Architecture. I could go on further as we took what we learned from Las Vegas to other projects, but these are other lessons of what I learned from. More flying with a net. What I learned from Encore Las Vegas, these are gonna go really quickly now, hold on to your seats. What I learned from Wynn Macau, our first learning from China experience, and what I learned from Encore Macau, our boutique scale hotel. Boutique scale being 500 rooms to us. That was uh, uh, one of the smaller. I'm currently redoing this entire project. And finally, what I learned from the jewel in our Wynn Resorts crown and the opportunity of a lifetime, Wynn Kotai Palace. Here we applied lessons from both Las Vegas and China. Natural light and flowers are attractive and beautiful to all cultures and to all humans. Color can bring joy. It's an attraction in and of itself. It can make an empty space feel like the party is already happening. Cultural considerations are extremely important. Even the floral and room colors were selected for their value and significance in both Chinese history and in contemporary culture. Every detail must be considered and layered so the guests returning are always on a voyage of new discoveries. Drama is crucial, as is rarity and value. History of design must never be repeated or reproduced, but it welcomes reinvention. For the palace, we reinvented chinoiserie for the 21st century. And once more, I learned to give the guest a warm and familiar experience filled with surprise, consideration, originality, and drama. To animate every space, to give them ultimate, attractive, and new experiences, and to make them easy to find. This is a lifetime of lessons for which I am deeply grateful. I've been given an opportunity to create in an environment where much is destroyed to create in our world. Now I have the honor of teaching what I have learned. Now I have the honor of teaching what I've learned from Las Vegas to a new, eager, talented, and dedicated generation. I can share with them how I learned to create viable currency of beauty. And as I watch them create beauty, I know that whatever goes on in our world, there is hope. And don't forget the villains. Thank you. So you've now heard the first and last time I will read a speech. <laughs> uh, if there are any questions from the audience, I think I have about 10 minutes. No? Had enough? Thank you. Oh, yes. So, Lorev was 
Uh, the question is, uh, how did LaRev enter into the design of Win Las Vegas? Uh, and is some of the design based on LaRev? LaRev is a 1932 painting by Picasso of his then mistress, uh, Marie-Thérèse Voltaire. Um, considered one of the greatest Picassos in private hands at the time that Steve owned it. And in the beginning, Win was going to be called Le Rêve, which translates in French to, from French to English to the dream. And so I showed you the uh, parasol up, parasol down experience, which is a whole bunch of parasols that move and turn in concert. And that was my interpretation uh, of physically making a dream. In my dreams, uh, things start and stop without uh, knowing when they start and stop. There's kind of a, a lack of continuity to the way my dreams go. So the imagination of my design was that you're in one of the bars, parasol up or down, you're looking at the parasols while having a conversation with someone you love or don't love, and uh, you see the parasols, you turn back to have more of that conversation, you look back at the parasols, they've moved, they're in a different position. Am I in a dream? So that was a realization of Lorev for me. Uh, a lot of friends like David Geffen and Steven Spielberg said to Steve, what are you, crazy? You're the greatest brand in Las Vegas. Call it Wynn. Uh, and he did that. Uh, most of the resistance for calling it Wynn, by the way, was Mrs. Wynn. She was not quite ready to have her name up in lights. Uh, but we got over that, and uh, the rest is history. Thanks. Yes. Do you still do Michelle. Um, exact models for each remodel? Do you do the like the the exact replica for each time? So when we're beginning design of a hotel, we build a replica of a representative part of the casino in full scale. Everything works. We build every single guest room and every single suite. Everything works except the plumbing. Uh, we build. We now 3D print models of every piece of custom furniture, every single piece, custom piece of lighting, uh, every custom three-dimensional object that we design in studio. Uh, and because we're in-house, because I don't have to charge a fee, because uh, everybody is going, I can spend lavish amounts of time doing this. A lot of other design firms can't. I think that's one of our great secret weapons. And I think this uh, model budget that Steve has always allowed me is also a great secret weapon because when it opens, I'm not fixing mistakes. We fixed those years ago. Thank you. Yes. So, if, uh, so the, the question is about moving through our spaces, if I'm correct, and the sensory experience. So if you look at the history of the design that uh, Steve DeRyder and I have done together, it goes from the mirage where wayfinding was a bit frenetic. You walk through the middle of a casino on a pathway defined by carpet, uh, to developing uh, marble edges for those sometimes uh, arbitrary pathways at Bellagio. Uh, and we had to develop coin carts that could actually roll between marble and carpet to do that. We developed a balloon tire coin cart so we didn't crush marble, which was why it didn't happen before, uh, to win where the wayfinding is much more axial and symmetrical, which was when I finally got my point through, uh, that you should really be able to see your target whenever you're heading somewhere. Now, that doesn't happen in some spaces where we intentionally take you on a voyage. The entire retail promenade at uh, Bellagio is fairly straight, and you can see everything all at once. We conscientiously curved that idea at Wynn so that stores revealed themselves, by the way, giving uh, uh, a real leg up to the guys who are on the outside of the curve, as you experience to the view of the other guys. But you don't see the entire distance of this long retail promenade in one shot. So you curve around it. The same is true of the casino, which is shaped like a fan, where there's a curve to it. And that also helped increase the intimacy of the space. Uh, but we did develop places like the Wind Tower Suites, where you arrive at a port cochere, you go through uh, an explosive experience, which is a small atrium, and then you arrive straight on axis with the front desk. Uh, guests who check in at the front desk at Wynn 
uh, were able to be directed easily to a pathway that led to their elevators. But not as easily as we would have liked, so at, uh, at Encore we made the elevators even closer to the guest arrival. Uh, Encore was built with two arrival experiences, which we thought would work. You would always have to, you paid a lot of money for strip resort uh, real estate so that you could have a port per share on the strip. But we did such a good job of letting everybody know about arrival to the hotel at the port cochere on the north side, which was close to the rooms, that no one used the port cochere on the strip. It became a dead area in the hotel, lacking energy, which is how Encore Beach Club happened. That brought energy to that side. That was a $5 million port cochere that went bye-bye about three months after we opened. Uh, so lessons can be expensive. Uh, and, and the way people travel in Las Vegas and mega resorts is an ever-changing experience, uh, we, we've learned. The way the, the, the way the architecture of the strip changes greatly affects the way your entrances are used. They're not within your control. They're being changed uh, extra ex ex outside of your control. So uh, managing the way guests experience is a kind of a new challenge every day. Um, and we're facing that right now as we're doing some, some new experiences with Paradise Park, uh, our new development at the backside of Wynn. How do you get into Paradise Park? How do you get into Paradise Park from Wynn and Encore? Uh, and we've been moving things around for about six months to address just those questions. But we'll get it right. Thank you. Yes. Do you have a question? So, have you spent much time at Wynn? Okay, if you spend any time at Wynn, you will hear Mandarin spoken often. Uh, we have uh, a very, we have the, what is the highest end uh, casino resort in China, and uh, uh, there's a lot of cross-pollination between those. We're a real destination, we're a major brand in Asia, and so uh, Asian uh, tourists, whether they're visiting Las Vegas because of Wynn or just to visit Las Vegas, make a point of going to Wynn. So it, we, we have a lot of Asian gaming. Uh, that said, we also have a lot of German, French, British. Uh, we have a, a lot of cultures coming in from all over. So we try to be pan-culturally uh, considerate in who our guest is. But the philosophy is we design for the most sophisticated, most educated, most well-traveled guest the one who is the most demanding. We try to think like that guest and anticipate every one of their needs, all of their comfort. It's a big order, but we do that and we've been doing that for a long time. Uh, I have made grave mistakes uh, in cultural design uh, with, with certain things that I've done that have not been appropriate, like the story of the Salon Privé, where I created a gentleman's library as a gaming salon, but books contain the names of the dead. Uh, I did a whole series of custom art for the Baccarat rooms uh, when we opened them at Wynn Las Vegas that were uh, embroidered um, on silk and had pagodas in them. Pagodas are monuments to the dead. Who knew? I just thought they were great pieces of architecture. Uh, and they're, they're uh, ubiquitous in Chinese art. They're in almost every house, but not in a room where gaming goes on. Uh, you don't use white flowers in Southeast Asia. You never use the number four. We don't have floors 40 through 50 in our hotels because of that. Uh, our Asian guests won't stay on a floor that starts with four. So there's a lot of rules, but there are also rules for European guests. There are rules for um, uh, guests from the African continent, from South America. So we find that if we're just really considerate about things and get as much knowledge as we can, we can address that. But again, it's the most sophisticated, most demanding traveler that we design to. One more. Yes, sir. Uh, I think all of, the, all of us get um, wrapped up in the attached to, to our creations, and I think you probably understand seeing them go away better than you <laughs> <ever anyone. laughs> <laughs> so, One example is some friends of mine that just worked at Barnell, and they, when they did this thought tower, they had to demolish that gorgeous uh, marble uh, staircase that you showed, and they told me that that was like a million dollars, and now it's just gone. Oh, it was way more than a million dollars. There wasn't a straight line on that staircase. 
They didn't have to demolish it, they decided to demolish it. It was not really in the way of anything, and it was the most photographed single object uh, at Bellagio. So, this, you're talking about Bellagio? Uh, well, I didn't demolish the staircase at Bellagio, and there's some great memories and experiences of it. And for me, it's the voyage of, of creation that's the most important. The opportunities that I'm afforded by my partnership with Steve and DeRider and, uh, and my incredibly talented studio let me make my own dreams come true. And the voyage of getting that done, the challenge of inventing things that have never been seen before, including all of the custom parts and pieces that go together, running around to find things and go to factories and worry about all of that stuff, that's what I live for. Uh, and the moment of creation is what it's all about. And that's that, you know, getting to the edge, creating things that have never been seen before, takes you to an edge of kind of nervous when you reveal it, because we never reveal anything until the first day. We never let anything out. We're famous for not letting you see what it is. The day before we opened Wynn, I was sure that I'd ever created the best thing I'd ever done or the worst, but I wasn't sure which one it was. Uh, and, you can, and, I, and I think getting to that edge is really part of it. So once it's open, when, once I've seen it, I expect it to change. Uh, it's, it's part of what Las Vegas is. Las Vegas is a very organic organism. It's one that demands change because uh, the, the, the people who are coming to use it, the people who are spending money have different demands. Who could for, have foreseen the nightclub phenomenon of Las Vegas, right? We had extraordinary nightclubs. We had a, the first nightclub at Wynn, which was called Labette, brought in about $250,000. Like we did that room uh, with a good nightclub driver, Victor Dre, uh, in a 90-day redo. Or 90 days is our, you know, the time Steve gives me because he doesn't have patience for any more. 90 days later, we recreated Labette into a nightclub that brought $40 million to the bottom line the first year. Who knew, right? So you have to do these kinds of changes. And the genius of Steve Wynn is that he's always a step ahead. He's always seeing those opportunities that are next. And he's about 95% right. So the 5% that we don't, that isn't successful, the Laura Nightclub, that was actually my idea. Um, uh, not his. So those that we have to redo, we just redo quickly. You know, it's you learn from mistakes. Hopefully, you don't repeat them. Is all he demands. Thank you. It's been great to be with you today. Sorry for the technical difficulties.